today we will be discussing about the neat pg 2022 recalls uh, so the first question is there is a image which is given here so we need to identify this this was exactly asked during uh, for the exams so here in this particular image we can appreciate there is a edematous scrotal wall and we can see areas of blackish and purplish discoloration along with skin necrosis so and there will be history of white uh, uh, dishwater like discharge and there might be a history of fatty odor so what is the diagnosis fornia gangrene so what is fornia gangrene it is nothing but a idiopathic scrotal gangrene and it is necrotizing fasciitis of the scrotal wall which has history of abrupt onset and there might be a rapidly fulminating gangrene so gangrene will extend up to the deep fascia important point to remember gangrene will extend up to the deep fascia so what are the predisposing factors diabetes is a most common and most important risk factor to develop idiopathic scrotal gangrene or corneous gangrene there might be history of trauma anal infections and other important thing is immunosuppression so these all can result in corneous gangrene which is the organism responsible polymicrobial in origin so it is polymicrobial so both aerobic aerobic as well as anaerobic organisms are responsible for causing corneous gangrene so what is the pathology which is involved the pathology is obliterative arteritis of the arterioles of the scrotal skin so this is important question previously asked the underlying pathology is obliterative arteritis of the arterioles of the scrotal skin so coming to the clinical features there would be history of recent trauma or instrumentation there might be history of urethral stricture or rectal source of infection so rectal source of there might be uh, infective foci which is there in the rectum and this can result in the patients like diabetes or during immunosuppression they can result in having corneous gangrene coming to the symptomatology pain is a cardinal symptom along with fever and there would be marked systemic toxicity remember this there should be a marked systemic toxicity in corneous gangrene and on clinical examination crepitus is appreciated crepitus is appreciated in corneous gangrene so how do you manage such a case we going to start empirical antibiotics there will do a aggressive surgical debridement of the fat and fascia of the scrotal wall and one should remember here orchidectomy is not performed orchidectomy is not required in case of corneous gangrene remember this coming to the next question so a patient would present patient presents with infertility patient presents with infertility and semen analysis shows azospermia or aspermia or azospermia and on histopathological image it shows certainly only cells certainly certainly cells only so what is this certainly cell only syndrome where do you see it we going to see this in high grade varicocele so the diagnosis of this condition would be high grade varicocele it is a type of non obstructive azospermia or non obstructive aspermia in this condition there will be we can appreciate only the certainly cells and there is complete absence of leydig cells so why this happens this is because there is a complete loss of germinal epithelium in the testicular tubule and clinically it would present as aspermia so this condition is also referred to as germ cell aplasia and this is classically seen in high grade varicocele it is also referred to as non obstructive azospermia and what is the underlying uh, uh, genetics here it is micro dilution of azfa that is azospermia factor a micro deletion happens here and this is classical with certainly cell only histology remember this aspect certainly cell only histology this is a new question which has appeared now so certainly cell only histology there is absence of leydig cells there is complete loss of germinal epithelium in the testicular tubule and one should remember non obstructive azospermia and this is classically seen in high grade varicocele so we going to see this in high grade secondary varicocele the next question is a patient would present with history of claudication of calf muscles there is thigh numbness there is impotence and gangrene of the foot so where is the level of obstruction this was the question asked 
This is nothing but the Leris syndrome where the obstruction is at the aortoiliac bifurcation. So remember this aortoiliac bifurcation, there would be history of cough muscle claudication, there would be thigh numbness, there is impotence and gangrene of the foot. So let's try to understand other site of blocks and what are the clinical features with which they present. If there is only cough claudication, it would either be seen in superficial artery obstruction, popliteal artery obstruction or pleural artery obstruction. If there is a pain which is claudication pain which is there in the thigh and cough, it is likely to be a common femoral artery obstruction. And if it is in the buttocks, thigh and cough, then it is aortoiliac. Along with this, there would be impotence. Remember this. So, aortoiliac obstruction, there would be claudication at the buttocks, thigh and cough along with impotence. Let's try to uh, solve a few, or, a few more MCQs. Which is the most commonest uh, peripheral arterial uh, occlusive disorder? It is atherosclerosis. There is something known as ankle brachial index. Ankle brachial index is very important. So the normal would be 1 to 1.2. If it is more than 1.2, it is non-compressible and severely calcified vessel. You normally see this in diabetes mellitus and end stage renal disease. So non-compressible severely calcified vessel. ABI would be more than 1.2. If the ABI is between 0.5 to 0.9, it is nothing but intermittent claudication and this is seen in mild to moderate ischemia. If there is critical limb ischemia, this is the other important MCQ question, ABI would be between 0.1 to 0.4. The other two things which you need to remember in uh, PVD uh, MCQs is what is Boyd's classification, what is Fontaine's classification. Boyd's classification is for intermediate claudication and remember this grade 4 is nothing but rest pain. Whereas in Fontaine's classification, grade 3 is ischemic rest pain and grade five, 4 will be gangrene. So remember this, in Boyd's classification, rest pain is grade 4 whereas in Fontaine's classification, rest pain would be stage 3. The other MCQs here are for digits, what is the ischemic time? It is 8 hours and for the entire extremity, it is between 4 to 6 hours. So, these two are important MCQs. Ischemic time for digits, 8 hours. Ischemic time for extremity, it is between 4 to 6 hours. Let's come to the next question. This image, particular image was shown and it is very classical, uh, looks like a orange peel. So, it is powder orange appearance. And what is powder orange appearance? It is nothing but the cutaneous lymphatic edema and this occurs mainly because of involvement of the subdermal lymphatics. Let's try to solve other questions related to this. This is normally seen in carcinoma of breast. So infiltration of Cooper ligaments, there would be dimpling and puckering. Dimpling is nothing but the small depression and puckering is a small fold or wrinkle of skin. There is one more entity referred, to, uh, referred as uh, cancer and curase. So, cancer and curase is nothing but there is infiltration of the breast skin and chest wall with multiple nodules and ulcerations. So, if you see multiple nodules and ulcerations with infiltration of breast skin, it is nothing but cancer and curase. So, if there is powder arch, what T stage it would be? It would be T4B. So, T4B also contains powder arch, skin ulceration and satellite skin nodules. So, remember this T4B. So, T4B is powder orange. And what is 4D? 4D is nothing but inflammatory breast carcinoma comes under 4D. So, if it is 4B, T4B, then it would be either stage 3B or more. And stage 3A, 3B and 3C are referred to as locally advanced breast carcinoma. So, locally advanced breast carcinoma is stage 3A, B and C. So, if there is 4B, then it is stage 3B and it is a locally advanced breast cancer. So, how do you want to manage? Start with new adjuvant chemotherapy, then followed by modified radical mastectomy and then we are going to give patient adjuvant radiotherapy. Let's discuss also the newer drugs which are used in uh, carcinoma of breast. In case of refractory metastatic breast cancer, we are going to give the patient sunitinib. If, uh, if the patient 
uh, is taxin resistant, then we're gonna give the patient ixabi pilone. And uh, there is one more uh, term, lapatinib, one more drug, lapatinib. It is nothing but the inhibitor of HER2 nu and also the inhibitor of EGF tyrosine kinase. So remember three drugs, sunitinib, lapatinib and ixabipilone. Okay. The next question which was asked is, there is a history of post-thyroidectomy. So the patient has underwent thyroidectomy and on POD3, post-operative day 3, we are going to appreciate perioral numbness and there is Chaustex sign positive. So what is the diagnosis? It is parathyroid insufficiency. The question which was asked is what is the next investigation we need to do? So the investigation we need to ask is serum calcium, serum phosphate and PTH assay. So in parathyroid insufficiency, there would be hypocalcemia. And why this parathyroid insufficiency occurs in thyroidectomy? Either it might be inadvertent removal of the parathyroid glands or there is infarction which has occurred due to vascular injury. So these are the two viable reasons why the parathyroid insufficiency would have occurred in post-thyroidectomy case. And symptomatology wise, hypocalcemia would present with circumoral or fingertip numbness and tingling. There would be tetany, circumpedal, uh, carpopedal spasm and laryngeal strider. So, how do you want to treat such a case? If there is transient hypocalcemia, so there is a temporary hypocalcemia and the patient is asymptomatic and serum calcium is more than 8, nothing to be done. The normal serum calcium would be around 8.5 to 10.5 milligram per deciliter. So, if it is more than 8 and there is patient is asymptomatic, no treatment has to be instituted. If there is mild symptoms and serum calcium is less than 8, then we can go for oral calcium and if the symptoms are severe, then we can go for IV calcium. So what we give is calcium gluconate, 10% of calcium gluconate over 10 minutes, 10% calcium gluconate, 10 ml of it over 10 minutes and it can be given TID. So in severe symptoms, we can go for IV calcium. And in permanent hypocalcemia, we are going to treat the patient with oral calcium along with vitamin D supplementation. So other MCQ which is frequently asked is what is the daily requirement uh, replacement dose of thyroxine. So daily replacement dose of thyroxine would be 1.6 micrograms per kg body weight. Remember this, daily replacement dose of thyroxine is 1.6 micrograms per kg body weight. The next question which was asked was, all of the following are the features of meant to be except, is it parathyroid adenoma, megacolon, morphonoids features or mucosal neuromas? The answer is parathyroid adenoma because parathyroid adenoma is seen in men 1 and men 2a but not in men 2b. The question is meant to be. So let's try and understand what is men 1, men 2a, men 2b and men 4. So, MEN1 is nothing but Wormer syndrome. Remember this three P's, pituitary, pancreas and parathyroid. Okay. So, in pituitary, we are going to have pituitary adenoma and the most commonest is prolactinoma. And in pancreas, there would be pancreatic neuroendocrine tumors. So, two types would be there, non-functioning and functioning type. In non-functioning, pancreatic polypeptide is the most commonest, whereas in functional type, Gastrinomas are most common uh, followed by insulinoma. So remember this, in gastrinoma are most common in pancreatic neuroendocrine tumor in men 1. When it comes to the parathyroid, parathyroid there would be adenomas again and patient would be having primary hyperparathyroidism and patient would present with features of hypercalcemia. So what is meant to a meant to a is also referred to as Sipper syndrome. There is mutation in the red oncogene cysteine codon level, and this is the chromosome is 10, chromosome 10. So remember for meant to a and meant to b, chromosome is 10, and there is mutation at the red oncogene. So in Sipper syndrome, we are gonna have medullary thyroid carcinoma and pheochromocytoma. So medullary carcinoma of thyroid and pheochromocytoma are common between 2a and 2b. Okay, remember this. So, what distinguishes between 2A and 2B? That is, in 2A, we are going to have Ersprung's disease, cutaneous lichen, amyloidosis, and parathyroid hyperplasia and adenoma. So, parathyroid adenoma is seen in 2A and not in cases of 2B. Remember this. 
there is associated Hirschsprung's disease and cutaneous lichen amyloidosis in men 2A. Whereas in men 2B, is also referred to as men 3. We, as I said, already there is medullary carcinoma of thyroid and pheochromocytoma. So what distinguishes between them is patient would be having ganglioneuromas, mucosal neuromas, megacolon and morphonoid feature. So morphonoid feature, megacolon are feature of men 2B and they would be associated mucosal neuromas. And the uh, mutation happens in the red oncogene which is there on chromosome 10 and at the domain tyrosine kinase. So tyrosine kinase domain, red oncogene mutation and on chromosome 10. Remember this for men 2B. So what is men 4? Men 4 is again parathyroid adenomas, pituitary adenomas and there is neuroendocrine gastropancreatic tumor that is gastrinoma. So this is something similar to men 1. Apart from these features that the patient would be having papillary thyroid carcinoma, there might be myasthenia gravis, adrenal testicular and cervical cancer and there are autoimmune diseases like Crohn's disease, Cushing's autoimmune thyroiditis and acromegaly which are classically seen in men 4. Okay. So the next question is which is the most commonest site of intraperitoneal abscess? So one should remember uh, in lying down position the most dependent would be hepatomorison's pouch also referred to as right subhepatic space and in upright position when the patient is standing erect then the pelvis is the most commonest site but when it comes to overall it is uh, hepatomorison's pouch which is the most commonest site for intraperitoneal abscess. So these are the beautiful diagrams which are given in Bailey Love. You can go through it. They have labeled it. They have explained it. And three important points which I noted in that particular topic is what is the most commonest cause of infection in left subhepatic space? So in left subhepatic space, what is the most commonest cause of infection? It is complicated acute pancreatitis. What is the deepest space? It is the right subhepatic space is the deepest space. So cause of infection, most common cause of infection in the left subhepatic space is complicated acute pancreatitis. Whereas in the right subhepatic space, one should remember it is the deepest space and it is the most common site for intraperitoneal abscess. That is right subhepatic space or hepatomorison's recess or hepatomorison's space. What is the most commonest site for subphrenic abscess? It is again the right subhepatic space. So right subhepatic space, remember three things. Most commonest site for intraperitoneal abscess. It is the deepest sac, deepest space. And also remember this is the most commonest site of subphrenic abscess. So that is right subhepatic space or hepatomorison's pouch. The next question which is asked is, the patient would present with severe abdominal pain and there is vomiting. X-ray is shown as below. So X-ray is showing air under the diaphragm. So you can appreciate there is air under the diaphragm. So what condition it is? It is perforation peritonitis, likely to be a hollow viscous perforation. So what the question was, what is the most effective treatment we want to give? We want to resuscitate the patient first and undergo a exploratory laparotomy. So this is the question which was asked. So resuscitation with exploratory laparotomy, which is the best view. So the best view would be a upright chest X-ray. If the patient is not able to stand erect, then left lateral debit decubitus is the next best a view which you can avail. The other view is supine view. So what are the different causes? With mainly with perforation peritonitis, secondary to peptic ulcer perforation. It can be inflammatory processes like diverticulitis, appendicitis, toxic megacolon or necrotizing enteritis. It can be secondary to infarction. It can be a malignant neoplasm perforation. It can be hydrogenic following endoscopic procedures, penetrating abdominal traumas, gas forming peritonitis or there might be a pleuroperitoneal fistula and the patient develop pneumothorax so the patient will develop pneumoperitoneum. And also if the patient has underwent recently a laparotomy or laparoscopic procedure, again air under diaphragm can be appreciated. So before taking the x-ray, how long the patient has to be there in that position? For 10 minutes. Remember this, 10 minutes. This was previously asked. How long you require? 10 minutes. And even 1 ml of air, even 1 ml of air can be detected for pneumoperitoneum, for pneumoperitoneum. So there is one syndrome referred to as Chilarditi syndrome. It mimics the pneumoperitoneum. So it is interposition of the colon between the liver and the diaphragm. So it is actually not a pneumoperitoneum. That's why it is referred to as Chilarditi syndrome, which is the interposition of the colon between the liver and the diaphragm. 
So what are the different signs we are going to appreciate in a case of pneumoperitoneum and a supine film X-ray? It is referred to as football sign, cupola sign, regular sign and triangle sign. So football sign is air would be accumulated in the center. Cupola sign is excessive air under the diaphragm on the right side that is cupola sign and regular sign is air is appreciated in the wall of the intestine that is regular sign okay so football sign cupola sign and regular sign next question which was asked is 11 month year old baby with history of pain abdomen with multiple episodes of vomiting and there is a mass in the right lumbar region and x-ray shows this is a barium enema barium enema shows a claw appearance or a claw sign in barium enema so what is the condition the condition is interception So this is the answer, this diagnosis is interception. So let's discuss about few important points regarding interception. Apex is the most uh, prone for gangrene. So apex of interception is the uh, most prone for gangrene. Most commonest type is iliocolic followed by iliocolic, iliocolic, and colocolic. So most commonest is iliocolic, less common is colocolic. Remember this, both are MCQs. Iliocolic is, iliocolic is the most common type of interception. Most common lead point is Meckel's diverticulum. So most common lead point is Meckel's diverticulum. Meckel's diverticulum itself is a MCQ question. Where do you see recurrent interception? You want to see it in cystic fibrosis. Previously asked question. So recurrent interception is seen in cystic fibrosis. On a plain x-ray, what are the different signs you are going to appreciate for interception? Target sign and meniscus sign. On barium anima, we are going to appreciate claw sign and coil spring sign so this is what is coil spring sign this might be the next year's mcq so coil spring sign that's why i put this particular image coil spring sign on an ultrasound you can have bull's eye sign and pseudo kidney sign so pseudo kidney sign was also previously asked pseudo kidney sign is seen in interception okay so next question which was asked is long standing hemorrhoids hemoglobin is 7 gram percent and peripheral smear is showing hypochromic Microcytic anemia. So, what is the diagnosis? It is nothing but iron deficiency anemia. So, iron deficiency anemia is seen in long standing hemorrhoids, and the patient is having bleeding PR for a long duration. The next question which was asked is a patient who would present with recurrent painful, painful recurrent perianal nodules on the buttocks with serous discharge. Image is shown. So, what is the diagnosis? So the diagnosis is multiple painful peri perianal nodules on the buttocks with serous discharge. The diagnosis is fistula in ano. So what are the different causes of fistula in ano? Anorectal abscess, most common. Cryptoglandular abscess is also referred to as cryptoglandular abscess. It might be Crohn's disease, secondary to tuberculosis, lymphogranuloma, venerum, actinomycosis, malignancy. We have something called Parks classification. The most commonest being type 1 that is intersphinctric, type 2 is transphinctric, type 3 is suprasphinctric, and type 4 is extrasphinctric. MRI is the gold standard for diagnosis, and one should remember Gutzer's rule. Gutzer's rule is very important clinically as well as also for the MCQ point of aspect. Multiple times Gutzer's rule has been asked, Parks classification has been asked, and certain which of the following are the causes of fistula in nano except such a question would be there so remember the most commonest is the anorectal abscess or cryptoglandular abscess there can be history of Crohn's, tuberculosis, lymphogranuloma venerum, actinomycosis and malignancy so remember this fistula in nano is an important topic the next question which was asked is a male patient presents with history of slow growing midline swelling in the anterior part of the neck six months after six months patient developed bilateral cervical lymph node and histopathological slide was shown so the image shows orphan ani eye nuclei okay so she is orphan ani eye nuclei 
So we can appreciate in this diagram the orphan and I, I nuclei. So what are the midline swellings? The midline swellings can be sublingual dermoid or lipoma. It can be submental group of lymph nodes. We can have Ludwig's angina, thyroglossal cyst, thyroid swelling. We can have suprasternal uh, suprasternal burns, uh, lipoma, and we can have subhyoid bursitis. These are all the midline swelling. So this is a classical history where male with slow growing midline swelling in the anterior part of the midline. So this might be a thyroid swelling. After six months, the patient develops bilateral cervical lymph node. And once they have shown the histopathology, that is orphan and I, then it is definitely a case of diagnosis would be a papillary carcinoma of thyroid. So let's discuss some so points about papillary carcinoma of thyroid. So the question was, uh, which of the following uh, is related to papillary carcinoma of thyroid? So lymphatic spread seen, specific nuclear pattern that is orphan and I, I nuclei pattern is seen, excellent prognosis. And uh, most it is the most common thyroid cancer in children and individuals exposed to external radiation. So uh, papillary carcinoma of thyroid is commonly seen in children, and, uh, most common thyroid cancer in children and individuals exposed to external radiation and most common thyroid cancer seen in iodine sufficient areas. So this is also a question which is asked in iron, uh, iodine sufficient areas which is the most common thyroid cancer it is papillary carcinoma of thyroid. Okay. And the somoma bodies are also appreciated. So these are the somoma bodies. They are nothing but the microscopic calcified deposits and clumps of sloughed cells. So what are the differential diagnoses of somoma bodies? What are the causes of somoma bodies? It can be papillary carcinoma of thyroid, papillary type of renal cell carcinoma, meningiomas, and serous cyst adenoma of ovary. So these are the four causes of uh, somoma bodies. Papillary carcinoma of thyroid, papillary type of renal cell carcinoma, meningioma and serous cyst adenoma of the ovaries. So in these conditions, you're going to see the somoma bodies. So papillary carcinoma spreads by lymphatic spread, follicular by hematogenous spread and anaplastic by the direct invasion. Where do you see pulsating secondaries? It is seen in follicular thyroid cancer and also in renal cell carcinoma. So pulsating secondaries are seen in follicular uh, carcinoma of thyroid and renal cell carcinoma. The next question which was asked is, a uh, patient has underwent surgery for varicose veins and he complains of numbness along the medial aspect of the leg. So what is the nerve which is involved? What is the nerve involved? So it is the saphenous nerve. Many times this question has been asked. This is the saphenous nerve. So there is one line in Bailey. Uh, great saphenous vein should only be stripped just below the knee to avoid damage to the saphenous nerve. Remember this aspect. When you are doing the stripping, it should be done just below the knee so that to avoid the saphenous nerve injury okay the next question which was asked is mass patient has uh, underwent a massive low traffic accident and after three days suddenly the patient develops dyspnea and petechial rash and this is what how the abdomen looks like so what is the diagnosis so patient has uh, underwent a massive road traffic accident that means that patient would have incurred some long bone fractures and when there is long bone fractures and there is dyspnea one should suspect fat embolism and in fat embolism we can have petechial rash. So on x-ray there is no storm appearance. Urine you can see fat globules in the urine and what are the early warning signs of uh, uh, fat embolism? There would be pyrexia and tachycardia. Remember this within 72 hours if there is pyrexia and tachycardia in a patient who has underwent massive who, who has uh, faced a massive road traffic accident, one should suspect fat embolism and if there is pyrexia and tachycardia within 72 hours. Remember this point. The next question which was asked is a 30 year old patient met with a road traffic accident and there is bruise which is appreciated on the chest and the patient would be having tachycardia, hypotension and tachypnea. Chest x-ray shows tension pneumothorax. So what, what is the best in, uh, management we can do? So we can go for ICD insertion. This was the question asked and answer would be ICD insertion. So in tension pneumothorax there would be intra-pleural pressure would be more than the atmospheric pressure. So there would be a lung collapse. You cannot appreciate the lung has collapsed completely in this particular image and there is built up of positive pressure within the hemothorax. So in the hemothorax there is positive pressure which is built up. And then the intrapleural pressure would be more than the atmospheric pressure. So this will result in the lung collapse. 
So the best way is to put the ICD. So ICD is put in safe triangle. So this also MCQ which is asked. Okay. And the next question is a 65 year old uh, patient gradually develops uh, growth beside the nose near the medial canthus and it is uh, in increasing uh, rapidly uh, and there is history of ulceration and uh, histopathology image shows peripheral palisading. So histopathology will show peripheral nuclear palisading. You can appreciate here the nuclear palisading which is happening. So this is classically seen in basal cell carcinoma. So basal cell carcinoma, some of important points. It is also known as rodent ulcer. It's a low-grade malignancy, and most common risk factor is exposure to sunlight. What is the most common site? Remember this: nose is the most common site, followed by the inner canthus of the eye. This is frequently asked. So what is the most common site? Nose is the most common site. There is also the most common type of skin cancer. So most common type of skin cancer is basal cell carcinoma. Most common type of basal cell carcinoma is nodular type. And in nodular type, the description is there would be central depression along with umbilication. So central depression with umbilication is the most common is seen in nodular type. It is the most common type of basal cell carcinoma. The basal cell carcinoma is also associated with prolonged administration of arsenic so which element arsenic remember this arsenic is associated with basal cell carcinoma and uh, this particular malignancy spreads by local invasion and one should remember that regional lymph nodes are not involved so regional lymph nodes are not involved in case of basal cell carcinoma okay the next question which was asked is patient bedridden for 15 years and there is a bed sore so which grade it is so grading is done by American National Pressure Ulcer Advisory Panel Classification. This is given in Bailey and Low. So stage 1 is non-blanchable erythema without a breach in the epidermis. So there is no breach in the epidermis. There is just a non-blanchable erythema which is seen. So there is no ulceration. There is without any, without a breach. That means that there is no ulcer. Okay. There is just a non-blanchable erythema which is appreciated. There is partial thickness, skin loss involving the epidermis and dermis. So partial thickness is stage 2 full thickness skin loss is stage 3 and if there is full thickness skin loss along through the fascia with extensive tissue destruction uh, involving the muscle bone or tendon it is stage 4 so in the diagram which is shown here we can appreciate that there is full thickness loss of skin along with there is destruction of the fascia and the underlying muscles so this is likely to be a grade 4 so grade is grade 4, stage 4 of pressure source. The next question which is asked is chronic alcoholism with whitish patch. So this is nothing but leukoplakia. So leukoplakia is nothing but white carotidic plate or patch that cannot be rubbed off or cannot be given another diagnostic name. So remember this, this is the definition of leukoplakia. So pathology features are there would be hyperkeratosis, parakeratosis and acanthosis. Remember this parakeratosis, hyperkeratosis is associated with leukoplakia. There is one line which is given erythroplakia is 17 times higher risk of malignant transformation than leukoplakia. So which is more dangerous? Erythroplakia is more dangerous and this is frequently asked question. So 17 times more higher risk of malignant transformation in case of erythroplakia than leukoplakia. The next question which I was asked is there is history of recurrent swelling on one side of the neck and there is a patient would be having fear of eating food and eating food will increase the swelling size. So swelling size will increase after having food. So what is the likely diagnosis? So it is going to be seen in CLO lithiasis. So 80% is seen in submandibular gland. Most common site is Warthen's duct. So if there is obstruction at the Warthen's duct, so there would be a increase in size of the submandibular gland, and that's and patient would have excruciating pain. That's why the patient would have fear of eating food. Okay. Composition of such a stone is calcium, magnesium, phosphate, or carbonate, 
and it, remember this 80% of them are radio opaque. So remember this is MCQ. Most common site is Warthens duct. 80% of them are radio opaque. And referred pain to the tongue is via the inguinal nerve. So there is a referred pain to the tongue which is noted and it is via the lingual nerve. And investigation of choice is non-contrast CT scan. So if there is celulolithiasis, investigation of choice is non-contrast CT scan. Next question is, there is a non-tender firm swelling at the angle of the mandible. Image shown is this. So what is the image? Most probable diagnosis it might be a, because it is in the parotid region, it is most likely to be a parotid gland swelling and most commonest parotid gland swelling is pleomorphic adenoma. So the answer is pleomorphic adenoma. So it's a most common benign uh, salivary gland tumor. The most commonest site is parotid tail in the superficial lobe. There is pseudopodia, There's, that's the reason why enucleation is not done and if enucleation is done, there is high chance of recurrence and or recurrence is 100% uh, it would result in 100% of recurrence. So it's a dumbbell tumor, the deep component both in neck and the oral cavity. So we are going to go for right superficial periodectomy or patase operation. Incision is lazy as or modified blades or cistrunk incision. Second most common benign tumor would be Warthin's tumor also referred to as adenolymphoma. The most common malignant tumor of parotid uh, gland, most common radiation induced neoplasm is uh, mucoepidermoid carcinoma. There is again classified into low grade and high grade. Again low grade would, uh, would mimic pleomorphic adenoma. Remember this aspect. Most common tumor, malignant tumor of parotid gland is mucoepidermoid carcinoma. Most common malignant tumor of submandibular sublingual or minor salivary gland would be adenoid cystic carcinoma. And one uh, very important feature which you need to remember about adenoid cystic carcinoma is that it has perineural invasion. The next question which is asked is a 45 year old female patient will present with the galactoria. Urine pregnancy test is negative and MRI shows a large pituitary tumor. So what is the likely diagnosis? The answer is prolactinoma. In prolactinoma, there is galactoria and amenorrhea. Remember this. And there is no gynecomastia. So it's not a cause for, uh, uh, prolactinoma is not a cause for gynecomastia. So there is only galactoria and amenorrhea. Drug of choice is bromocryptin. So it shrinks uh, prolactinomas in 75% of the cases. It is the most common functional pituitary tumor and surgical aspect. How do you want to treat? The treatment of choice is surgery. That is intranasal transpenoidal approach. We are going to resect the prolactinoma. The next question which was given is rupture of secular aneurysm and the image is shown. So there is hypersensitivity which is noted in the spaces and this is subarachnoid hemorrhage. So subarachnoid hemorrhage is classified into acute, subacute and chronic. If it is less than 3 days, it is acute. If it is between 4 to 21 days, it is subacute. And if it is more than 21 days, it is referred to as chronic subarachnoid hemorrhage. Most common cause is trauma followed by spontaneous rupture of various aneurysm. And if you do a CSF tapping, you are going to appreciate xanthochromic spinal fluid. Berry aneurysm also referred to as secular aneurysm is the most common intracranial aneurysm. It is uh, mainly involved with circle of willis in 85% of the cases. Most common uh, site for bellinus aneurysm is between a uh, anterior communicating artery and uh, anterior cerebral junction. So what are the risk factors? So increased risk is noted with ADPKD, this polycystic kidney disease. Euler Danler syndrome, neurofibromatosis type 1, Marfa syndrome, fibromuscular dysplasia, and coarctation of aorta. This is about subarachnoid hemorrhage. The next question which was given is there is erythematous neck swelling at the supraclavicular region and it is a pulsatile swelling. So, what is the investigation you want to go for? Investigation of choice would be a the first investigation would be a ultrasound Doppler of the neck. So, here a delayed uh, IV urogram image is shown and it is showing classical hydronephrosis. So what is the diagnosis? It is pelvic junction obstruction. So there is a hydronephrosis and pelvic junction obstruction is the answer. So investigation of choice is DTPS scan 
and what is the treatment we are going to go for anderson heinz this membrane pyloplasty this has been frequently asked question anderson heinz this membrane pyloplasty the most common cause is fetal hydronephrosis it is associated with water defects water stands for vertebral anomalies anorectal malformation tracheoesophageal fistula and radial renal dysplasia the next question is 6, six year old with recurrent history of recurrent urinary tract infection micturating cystourethrogram shows bilateral dilated tortuous ureter with reflux so what is the diagnosis it is vesico ureteric reflux is the most common inevitable disease of the genito urinary tract it is autosomal dominant condition 75% of them would be asymptomatic most common anatomical cause would be a posterior urethral valve remember this point most common anatomical cause for vesico ureteric reflex is posterior urethral valve and there is international classification for mcu grading for uh, vur Grade one is reflex into the non-dilated ureter. Grade two is reflex into the pelvis and calyces without dilation. If the grade three is mild to moderate dilation of the ureter, renal pelvis and calyces with minimal blunting of fornices. And if there is blunting of fornices, it is grade four. And grade five is gross dilatation of ureter, pelvis and calyces, loss of papillary impression, and there will be a ureteral tortuosity. Okay, this is the image given. It is a diagnostic image. Uh, so classically given uh, the answer would be ectopic vesicae is also known as extropy of the bladder there is complete ventral defect of the urogenital sinus uh, and uh, overlying skeletal system so this is a defect in the infra umbilical portion of the anterior abdominal wall and there is incomplete development of anterior wall of the bladder association complete epispadias there would be white shallow scrotum there is undescended testis inguinal hernia and in females there would be bifid clitoris okay so there would be white shallow scrotum there is a white shallow scrotum undescended testis inguinal hernia and bifid clitoris complications would be total urinary incontinence adenocarcinoma of the bladder fibrosis and hydronephrosis to augment the bladder capacity we should undergo enterocystoplasty and the treatment of choice would be urinary diversion with cystectomy the next question which was given is uh, cystoscopy shows multiple yellow white plaque in the bladder and histopathological examination shows michaelis gutman bodies so what is the diagnosis the michaelis gutman's bodies this is the image which was given so the diagnosis would be malacoplakia so malacoplakia was asked twice or thrice during the previous uh, neat pg exams so this michaelis gutman bodies remember this it is associated with malacoplakia and uh, the important thing to remember it is defect in the phagocytosis so malacoplakia is associated with defect in phagocytosis and michaelis gutman bodies remember this so what is the root of mets of prostate cancer to lumbar vertebra it is answer is prostatic venous plexus or barsen's plexus this was the other question which was given root of mets of the prostatic cancer to the lumbar vertebra it is through the prostatic venous plexus that is barsen plexus the next question which was given is uh, patient has and uh, went through a road traffic accident and is unable to pass the urine and there is blood that the meatus and he patient is hemodynamically stable X-ray shows this fracture of the superior ramus and symphysis pubis, and that means that the patient is having pelvic uh, fracture. And RGU was done, and RGU is this is the image of the RGU. So there is a posterior urethral injury. The most common uh, posterior urethral injury is the membranous urethral injury. So remember this: if there is urinary retention, blood ductus meatus, and pelvic hematoma, one should uh, diagnose the patient to be having posterior urethral injury, and the patient also will be having a high-lying prostate. So high-lying prostate is seen with posterior urethral injury. So this was also previously asked many times. which is the most common site bulbo membranous junction more compared to the prostato membranous junction ivp in membranous urethral injury shows pie in sky appearance so uh, ivp in membranous urethral injury that is posterior urethral injury shows 
pi in sky appearance. The next question which was asked is, uh, there is a stab injury and hemodynamically stable. So what is the investigation you want to do? Since it is a hemodynamically stable stab abdominal injury, we have to go for contrast and CT scan of the abdomen and pelvis. The next question which was given was about the triage. Green color, it is nothing but ambulatory. So if it is red, it is immediate and most critically injured. So immediate care has to be given. If it is yellow, it is delayed. Less critically injured patient hospital re treatment required. Green is ambulatory, no life, limb threatening injuries and black is expectant, dead or moribund patient. The last question which has been given is uh, regarding the uh, Lund and the Browder's charting for the burns. So you can go through this. So remember this, this is for the burns. 